Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Maria Ignacia Barraza, and um, my email is there on the screen for all of you if you want to get in touch um, regarding anything that comes up in the lecture today. So today, this is um, a sample lecture from my World Lit 410 class, um, which is an advanced seminar on Latin American literature. Now, to start, and I do this with my students um, in these kinds of classes, I'd like to ask you what first comes to mind when you think about Latin America. So if we were all sitting in a class right now, I would ask you to grab a piece of paper and write down what first comes to mind when you think about Latin America. This is done anonymously, so people feel really comfortable in sharing their, their ideas. Um, perhaps when you thought of Latin America, the first thing that came to mind was Latin American music, right? Um, these Latin American artists that we're looking at are, of course, globally recognized. In fact, I'm sure many, if not all these faces are familiar to you, especially to our students. We have, of course, um, in the middle there, we have Jennifer Lopez, perhaps the most famous. To the right, we have Shakira from Colombia. Um, to the left, upper um, left-hand side, we have J Balvin from Colombia as well. And at the bottom, we have the Cuban rapper Pitbull. Okay, so maybe that's what came to mind when you thought of Latin America. Perhaps when thinking about Latin America, what came to mind was gritty TV shows um, or gritty series such as this one, Narcos, a very popular uh, TV series on, on Netflix. Um, and this is from the Netflix side. This is how they describe Narcos. Um, it, quote, tells the true story of Colombia's infamously violent and powerful drug cartels, end of quote. Maybe when thinking about Latin America, what came to mind first was soccer, okay? And we know how those Latin Americans are crazy about football, as we call it, soccer. Um, and here we have the picture you're looking at what we have, what many would say is perhaps the greatest soccer player of all times. Of course, I'm talking about Diego Armando Maradona. Um, now, I know if there are any Brazilians out there listening to this, I know you would protest and you would say, well, no, we know Pelé, you know, is the greatest soccer player of all, all times. Um, but since we're dealing with um, Spanish speaking countries, um, I think Maradona is the better choice for obvious reasons, okay? To illustrate my point. Now, closer to some of the things that come up, usually when we talk about Latin America in popular culture in our days. Now, closer to the topic at hand, that is Latin American literature, um, the names and faces that are associated to Latin American literature um, are these. Okay, so you might recognize some of the faces. Most likely you'll recognize the names. Okay, um, especially in North America, these are the canonical authors that are most famous. So we have from left to right, we have the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. His love poems, if you haven't read them, um, are beautiful. Pablo Neruda is probably the most famous uh, Latin American poet of the 20th century. Um, up top, we have, of course, the Argentine Jorge Luis Borges, whose short stories as well um, are globally known and appreciated. Um, then we have the Argentine Julio Cortázar. And at the top there, we have the Colombian Gabriel García Márquez. So it's safe to say that these names, along with a select few others, are the most recognizable names in Latin American literature, especially, as I said, in North America. Indeed, as uh, world literature scholar David Damrosch has pointed out, quote, in many survey courses in North America, the entire continent of South America is represented, if at all, 
only in a couple short stories by Jorge Luis Borges and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And so the continent's rich literary traditions unfortunately compose a minor literature that hasn't found a secure place in courses oriented toward major cultures." End of quote. So this affirmation with which, um, by the way, I agree wholeheartedly, is one of many reasons why I created this course. Um, and as well, I, I included authors that are little known in North America. Um, and also around literary movements that precede the canonical authors that we just talked about, right? And that Damrosh mentions as well. Furthermore, Damrosh's affirmation confirms that indeed in the North American university classroom, um, and only, and I would say not only in survey courses, to talk about Latin American literature is to reduce it to a handful of authors um, who are br brilliant, of course, nobody denies that, um, but which in the end, if we only concentrate on them, if we only study and teach Jorge Luis Borges, Julio Cortázar, et cetera, um, I would argue this presents an impoverished uh, vision of Latin American literature. So to that end, um, and to fill in the gaps, so to speak, um, we begin this course with a literary movement known as Modernismo, okay? More on this in just a bit, okay? Um, and we end the course. So the last stop in this course is um, with the so-called Latin American boom and magical realism. So we see that, and to bring it back to David Damrush's quote here and his statement about boom writers and magic realist writers um, that take center stage on countless syllabi across North American universities. The main aim of this course is to show that there's so much more to Latin American literature than the canonical authors. Um, and that again, the most representative Latin American literature did not happen in a vacuum. And this is crucial. And this is something that students walk away with after having taken this course, realizing that there's so much more to Latin American literature than again, these canonical authors. Um, it'll also expose students to quote unquote rare or quote unquote obscure um, underrated Latin American authors that are again, little known in North America. So the rest of the lecture now will look like this. So two parts, part one, I'll give a more detailed structure of the course. Um, and then I'll move on to a, I'll talk about the boom and magic realism uh, because I imagine our audience, whoever uh, watches this um, will be more familiar with magical realism and the boom as opposed to say modernismo, okay? So to start with the course itself, um, we said this is an advanced seminar on Latin American literature, but please note, anybody watching this, any prospective students, uh, please uh, note that you're not expected to have any background knowledge of Latin American history, of Latin American literature, okay? In fact, I would say about 90, 80, 90 percent of students don't have any knowledge of um, either Latin American literature nor um, Latin American history. Um, the course is divided into three parts, okay? So uh, part one, so we begin the course, as I said, with um, a literary movement called Modernismo. That's born in the 1880s in Latin America. I'll talk about why that's, that's important in just a bit. Then the second part of the course centers on the historical avant-garde movements, which of course are born in Europe in the 1920s and how they're transplanted to Latin America. And then of course we end the course with the so-called Latin American boom of the 60s and 70s and magic realism as a type of literary fiction. Now, modernismo. 
students usually on the first day of classes ask why begin with modernismo why not go back to say you know the 17th century or you know the early 19th century um and the reason why we begin with modernismo, which by the way, is not to be confused with its equivalent in English, um, modernism um, in, in terms of um, name, right? So modernismo is not to be confused with modernism. Um, modernismo is something completely different. It can be called Spanish modernism. And why modernismo? I would say because modernismo is that first autonomous literary movement that's born and bred in the new world, again, in the 1880s. Um, and this is crucial. Modernismo had a great impact on the so-called old world and specifically in Spain. So this, and this is crucial, this is the first time, it's really the first time that Latin American writers claim cultural authority. They claim cultural authority in relation to Spain. And as her ex-colonial subjects, this is very powerful, right? Uh, when we think about it. Next, that second portion, the historical avant-garde movements. Um, that's the second part, second portion. Uh, it's about three, four weeks each that we spend on each of these movements. Um, we talk about the avant-garde movements born, of course, in the early 20th century. I'm born in Europe, as I said. I'm talking, of course, about all those isms of art that multiplied in the first decades of the 20th century. In regard to a Latin American context here, um, here's where students are able to see how this quote unquote imported cultural product is transplanted, is brought over from Europe into Latin America and is turned into something particular and unique to Latin America. Um, an example that we study is called ultraism, ultraism. And interestingly, students really um, enjoy hearing this. It was Jorge Luis Borges, whom we just talked about, um, who's more you know, associated to the boom, for example. Um, he was the one who brought this so-called ultra movement, uh, an avant-garde movement, from Spain, literally transplanted it to Argentina, and there it took root and grew, you know, very different from Spanish altruism, Argentinian altruism. So these are the things that we look at, um, the way um, different movements uh, take root in different cultural contexts. Um, lastly, that last third of the semester, so roughly the, the last three, four weeks of the class are dedicated to the boom in magical realism. And I highlight, highlighted that because again, I'll give you definitions and we'll talk about that um, in just a bit. Um, next, let's begin. So let's begin with a definition. Now that we know how the course is structured, let's begin with a definition of, of the so-called Latin American boom and of magical realism. So we see where they coincide and where they differ. So Latin American, Latin American boom <clears throat> and magical realism. So we can say about the boom that the boom is exclusively a Latin American socio-literary phenomenon, and it refers to a group of Latin American writers who began to publish their novels in the 1960s and the 1970s. Boom novelists include the Argentine Julio Cortázar, the Colombian Gabriel García Márquez, the Mexican Carlos Fuentes, as well as the Peruvian Mario Vargas Llosa. Um, please note, though, um, that these definitions, I should have said that before, these definitions of the boom and, boom and of magical realism are not meant to be exhaustive. Okay, this is just for the sake of the brevity um, for this um, lecture. We do expand on them in the classroom. So I'll give you the most salient characteristics of these movements. Um, the onomatopoeic, you might be wondering about the onomatopoeic quality of this term boom, right? Um, boom refers, of course, to the explosion of creativity, the explosion of production of this relatively young group of writers um, who became overnight um, 
global sensations, really worldwide. Um, their works began. Their works began to quickly um, circulate in translation soon after they were published in Spanish. And something else that we uh, talk about briefly, but we do mention it in class, um, and it is important to point it out, is that boom writers had leftist leanings, political leanings, and they coalesced, so they came together after the 1959 Cuban Revolution. So the Cuban Revolution uh, really brought these authors together. So again, we talk about that in a bit more detail, not too much, but in a bit more detail in the classroom. Now, when we talk about magical realism, we can say that as opposed to the boom, which is exclusively a Latin American phenomenon, magical realism is not exclusively a Latin American phenomenon. As it's been cultivated in other countries and regions, two of many examples I could give you, uh, the Czech writer Milan Kundera, and of course, Sam and Rushdie have both published uh, very well-known magic realist texts. And to talk about magical realism, again, I'm going to be very concise. Um, it's best defined, or it has been defined as a mode of writing. It's been defined as a literary style, a type of fiction. Some would call it a genre, not all critics would call it a genre. Um, so in regard, you might be wondering where these two, you know, um, intersect the boom and magical realism in a Latin American context. So in regard, to Latin American fiction, um, the connection between these two is that some, not all, some of these boom writers published very successful magic realist texts. And the most famous of all of these is of course the Colombian Garcia Marquez, who is both a boom writer and a magic realist. But please note, it's not, you know, to talk about the boom is not necessarily to talk about writers who exclusively cultivated magic realism, okay? Um, now, to talk about magical realism, the first thing that we need to do is to, you know, situate it in a magic realist, in a, sorry, in a Latin American context. So let's talk about where the term originates. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned this. So the boom, according to most critics, um, starts officially in 1962 when the Peruvian Mario Vargas Llosa publishes his The Time of the Hero and the Mexican Carlos Fuentes publishes his very well-known novel, The Death of Artemio Cruz and the lesser known novel, Aura. Okay, so the boom begins in 1962, according to most critics. Going back to magical realism, um, where and when did the term originate? Um, it originated in Germany. And it's really interesting because today, most people would as associate, uh, and rightly so, Latin American to magical realism, right? But the term itself is born, it originates in Germany, okay, in 1925. And it was the German historian and critic, Franz Roh, who coined the term. So it's the first time we see it being used. But it's interesting to note that it was used uh, in regard to painting, so in regard to the visual arts and not literature. So that was 1925 in uh, Roh's work after Expressionism, Magical Realism, Problems of the Newest European Painting. For the purposes of this lecture, it's important to point out that magical realism is first used in a Latin American context, that is to talk about Latin American literature in 1948 by the Venezuelan intellectual Arturo Uslar Pietri. So it's the first time that it travels. Again, we're talking about these texts that travel, right? Um, we have a text, you know, a term in this case, magical realism that travels from Germany to Venezuela in this case. And then soon after, in 1949, and this is crucial to understanding magical realism, interesting to point out that it is the Cuban writer, very well known, the Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier, who is the first to theorize. So Carpentier is the first to theorize uh, what today, an early version of what today we call magical realism. And in he does so in the prologue to his most famous work, the novella, The Kingdom of This World. And Carpentier theorizes what he calls the real marvelous, right? So he doesn't call it magical realism. He calls it the real marvelous um, in Spanish, lo real maravilloso. And very quickly, I just want to point out that in this very 
now famous uh, prologue, Carpentier pits two identities against each other. So a European identity and a Latin American identity. And that European identity is tied specifically to surrealism. We were just talking about the, all the isms at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he pits that against Latin America, a Latin American identity. Um, and what he talks about, he says, well, the real marvelous, lo real maravilloso, could simply not be situated in a European context. In fact, the novella, The Kingdom of This World, is set in Haiti. And Rabetier is saying, these things, these magical happenings, these marvelous things that take place could only take place on Latin American soil, right? Um, European artists, and again, surrealism, he's talking about surrealism uh, specifically, he says, um, the European artists can invoke the magical via sleight of hand. So, you know, they use these cheap tricks to evoke the magical. Um, whereas he says, Latin American artists don't need to do that. We don't need to resort to these sleight of hand, these kind of cheap tricks. Um, he says that, um, the magical, the real marvelous is something that's innate to the people of Latin America. It's something that's innate to its people, its flora, its fauna. It's almost like an integral part of the lived reality of Latin Americans. That's what Carpentier is saying. Now, to finish our concise definition and tracings of the term magical realism, um, I'd like to go over to some salient characteristics. But again, please note that this is just a very concise list. There are many, many more things that we do cover in class. So when we talk about magical realism, we can say that magical realism as a mode of writing, we said um, it presents the strange, bizarre, and fantastical as normal and commonplace. There are as well no explanation for fantastical events. There's the abundant, abundant use of metaphor, oxymoron, hyperbole, right? Um, 100 Years of Solitude is the canonical text of magical realism. Um, of course, it was published, written by the Colombian Garcia Marquez. And some of these works become political allegories, right? We were talking about the boom and their leftist le political leanings. Well, there's a lot to be said about that. We do not have the time, of course, right now to do so. But it's interesting to note, for example, 100 Years of Solitude is one of those texts that can be interpreted as a political allegory. Um, Komi Baba has said that magical realism is the literary language of the emergent post-colonial world. And this is something that we explore in this class as well. And um, students are really interested in this particular point right here. Um, and then as well, we have the use of allegory, myth, and legend, which is central to um, magic realist aesthetics. And finally, um, the flexibility of time. There's dumps in time, backwards, forwards, etc. cetera. Um, now to end, I'd like to wrap up this mini lecture by saying that by taking this course, um, students are able to see, I think, a less fragmentary, um, a less reductive vision of Latin American literature. And by extension, they're able to see um, and truly grasp, I think, the diversity of Latin American culture. Um, as we like to say in world literature, there's more than one way to see the world. And I think this course helps students really to do just that.